join the session, Jess? Yes. Yes, good, 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 good. My name is Jamar Doc Montgomery, and I'm currently a Cattle Parish Public Defender, as well as, as a candidate for the United States Senate, um, community justice advocate, and a militarized police and First Amendment expert. Um, so while we're waiting, go ahead and get, uh, get this started up. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about the ballot or the bullet, the Voting Rights Act, voter suppression, and political violence in America. As I said, my name is Jamar Doc Montgomery, and I'm a current public defender with the Cattle Parish, uh, Cattle Parish Defenders, Public Defender's Office in the juvenile section. Um, my website is there, my number is there, and I'm all, I can also be found on Facebook as Doc Montgomery. So, let's start things off. One of the things I wanna make sure of is that we have a baseline understanding. Malcolm X did not promote violence or hatred. Malcolm X promoted the American ideals of promoting one's life, liberty, and property by any means necessary, especially when all democratic and American institutions designed to protect all Americans refuse to recognize the human and constitutional rights of African Americans. Malcolm X realized that vigilante violence perpetrated by the KKK must be met with unapologetic self-defense. Racist policies are by definition and design unequal policies, even when they are democratically enacted by the majority. However, when the constitutional principle of equality for all conflicts with the will and rule of the majority, the scenes of the Constitution are pulled apart and can only be conquered by an equal and opposite force. Physical violence is the only check for disenfranchised communities when they are subject to abusive, unchecked, and unjust political and social power. When the judiciary allows inequality or discriminatorily grants privilege, it creates imbalance. Continual imbalances create systemic instability. Systemic instability invites violence and totalitarianism. The judiciary must act as the last bastion of democratic and constitutional principles, especially during times of political apathy and disengagement. Imperio in Imperium. A nation within a nation. Part of Malcolm X's ideology was that the ballot was not going to save us if we did not hold our government officials accountable. And if government officials were not going to respect the law or protect the voting rights of African Americans, thus securing the integrity of the American political process, then disenfranchised peace people must take up any and alternative means of exercising their voice and political will. The original swing vote was the black vote, and there have been consistent and concerted efforts of minimizing the swing effect of the black vote. Part of these measures included the shift of attention to Iowa and Wisconsin's earlier primaries, which provided early indicators of who the majority should get behind early on in the presidential races. Political and legal suppression. What does voter suppression look like? There are several means in which voter suppression happens. There's political and legal suppression, there's technological suppression, and lastly, there's physical suppression. Right now, we're gonna talk about the voting rights, campaign finance, electoral college, miscounts, recounts, and voter ID laws. Fairness means addressing the inequities. The challenge for the judiciary how do you create fairness when constitutional law and precedent establish African Americans as property first, then three-fifths of a person, then a full person, and then finally a citizen? We look at the introduction of the 13th Amendment, which made slavery conditional. Not that it abolished slavery, but made slavery conditional. Then we have the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equal protection under the law. However, even with those amendments, there was legislation that had to be enacted just to protect those rights. What we have seen through constitutional law is the disenfranchisement or the mental gymnastics or constitutional gymnastics of protecting the rights of a particular set of people being our enslaved ancestors and now how to integrate them within society uh, when their integration into society meant a threat to the economic and political power of the majority. One of the things that we'll take a look at is the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Civil Rights Act of 1866 says, all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall have the same right 
in every state and territory, in every territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties, give evidence, and to the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of the persons and property as enjoyed by white citizens, and shall be subject to life punishment, pains, penalties, taxes, licenses, and exactions of every kind and to no other. Next, we'll take a look at the 15th Amendment, which says the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, previous condition, or servitude. Section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. You have the right to vote or remain silent. Once again, after Reconstruction, it was that the blacks were supposed to be full members of society, but because of rec recognize, because we recognize that blacks had their own self-interest different from the majority, and we were locked out of the political system, it was very difficult for us to have a judiciary that was friendly to our rights, a legislator that was going to protect our rights, and an executive that was going to enforce our rights. So here it is, we see that after Reconstruction, this gymnastics once again of making sure that the rights of formal, of free and formerly enslaved African Americans were continually protected. What is one of the ways in which you can use your voice? Do your vote. If I can keep you from voting, then I can keep you from exercising your interest and making your interest law and enforceable by law. In the 15th Amendment, what we see is that there were grandfather clauses, gerrymandering, poll taxes, and literary texts. Gerrymandering. We look at Gamillion versus Lightfoot uh, in 1960, where the decision found that the redrawing of city limits by Tuskegee, Alabama officials to exclude the mostly black area around the Tuskegee Institute discriminated on the basis of race. The court later relied on this decision in Rice versus Cayetano in 2000 which struck down ancestry-based voting in elections for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. That really held that those elections violated the 15th Amendment by using ancestry as a racial definition and for a racial purpose. But I thought that we had gotten past a lot of this. As we see, we still are ena enacting amendments to further protect the constitutional rights that are supposed to be guaranteed to all citizens. If you have to enact more amendments, what you're saying is that there's different classes of citizenship. And without saying that there are different classes of citizenship, utilizing the judiciary of making law or interpreting the law as to set precedent that continues on a legacy of disenfranchisement or limited inclusion of, limited inclusion or protection of the constitutional rights of America. Another seminal case is United States versus Reese in 1876. In United States versus Reese, the narrow interpretation of the 15th Amendment upheld ostensibly race neutral limitations on suffrage, including poll taxes, literary tests, and a grandfather clause. If you were a slave or formerly enslaved, what capital do you have? How can you ever pay a poll tax? If you were formerly enslaved and you were not allowed to read, how, ever, how can you ever pass a literary test? And if your grandfather was a slave, how could you ever utilize your vote or utilize your right to vote if your grandfather did not have that right to vote? The 15th Amendment was interpreted in, eight, in United States versus Reese as the 15th Amendment does not, does not, confer the rights of suffrage upon anyone. It prevents the states or the United States, however, from giving preference in this particular to one citizen of the United States over another on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The court goes on to state, that right is exemption from discrimination in the exercise of the elected franchise on account of race, color, or previous condition. Here it is, is we would look at the 15th Amendment would grant the right to vote, yet the Supreme Court interpreted it as the right to be free from 
discrimination. So even there, we see that the judiciary is continually performing gymnastics and responding to the social will of the people and of the times and of the attitudes. Although the amendment is clear in its plain text, we find that societal context uh, limits a lot of those, uh, limits the a strict and literal interpretation of the law. Next, we have the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As we said, we talked about that progression from going from being considered property to be considered three-fifths of a person to being considered a full person to now being granted full rights of citizenship. We would imagine that the right to vote is that last bastion of citizenship. So now that right to vote being once again codified into law through the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But what would happen in 2013? A particular case called Shelby County versus Holder. It struck down section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, which provided the 40 year formula, which was no longer responsive to current needs. Therefore, section 5's pre-clearance requirement could not be fulfilled unless a new formula was developed. What it, that did, that the court decision literally gutted the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, because it's saying, well, the formula that we're using or the conditions that we experienced 40 or 50 years ago no longer apply. But we continually see an attack on the voting rights of disenfranchised and poor people here in America. How does voter disenfranchise happen? Does voter disenfranchisement happen? <laughs> We once talked about the Electoral College. The, Uni the United States Supreme Court has recently decided to hear two cases dealing with the Electoral College. Shia Follow versus Washington and Colorado's Department of State versus Baca. The Supreme Court of the, of the United States is hearing whether faithless electors can be penalized or removed from office if they do not vote for the presidential candidate chosen by their state voters. The one thing about the, state, about the Electoral College is that on an average basis, the Electoral College has the power to invalidate or validate the votes of 770,000 people. I'll say that again. The Electoral College has the power to validate or invalidate the vote of 770,000 people. So if you're the, the, elector, the presidential elector does not decide to go with what the majority vote or with what the law says about who they should vote for, the vote, the rights and voting rights of 770,000 people have rend been rendered null and void. Second, another way that we see voter disenfranchisement is through miscounts and recounts, and we saw that in Bush versus Gore in 2000. SCOTUS issued a stay of the Florida Supreme Court's order recount. They found that inconsistent recount procedures across the county lines violated the Equal Protection Clause. This judicial decision threatened the integrity of American elections and also the reputation of the judiciary. How does voter disenfranchisement happen on a more local basis? Through voter ID laws. We saw that in 2008, Crawford versus Marion County, which stated that an Indiana law requiring a picture ID to vote was not unconstitutional. We think of disenfranchisement only on one side about voters, but what about candidate disenfranchisement? Many of you here have ran for office and have become judges. As a result of becoming judges, you are an elected official. are higher in those countries than they are in our country. Again, laws that target law-abiding citizens rather than criminals and miscreants are not effective. The second issue is the constitutional one. 
The Constitution clearly states that it is the supreme law of the land. And it also clearly states that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It does not say shall Madam not Chair. be unreasonably regulated. It does not say shall not be abridged. Shall does not say shall not be abrogated. It says shall not be infringed. You cannot lawfully even touch it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.